This project emerges out of a question. One you might ask at a party or at a get to know you type of formal situation. Where are you from? My first answer is usually Flatbush. Second answer is Brooklyn. Most people know that Brooklyn is in New York, so they don't usually ask you know, further. But then some will ask, where are you from before that? And they usually say South Carolina, Guadalajara Island, Guadalajara Island. It's one of the sea islands off the coast of Charleston. That's where my dad's family's from. And then sometimes people continue and ask, before that? family just doesn't know. You just know somebody got put on the boat, they got sent to the West Indies, and eventually they ended up in Charleston. The beginning of the Gibbs family is a blank. In the same way the beginnings of lives of the majority of African Americans are a blank. Answering that question, where are you from, requires construction. You have to bridge the gap, the gap of the middle passage. And you have to put down a foundation so you can build where that blank space is. But when you build on that blank space, you have to take into account the fact that somebody's already built there. And you have to take into account what I call the Wikipedia effect, which is the fact that something doesn't have to be true to be the truth. It just has to have been disseminated by someone who's considered an authority. To continue on, the project started with the question, where are you from? But its push came from an, another question, which was, why did jazz start in the United States? What was it about American culture that made it happen here instead of somewhere else, and in particular somewhere else in the New World? What cultural groups, what tribe or tribes, what combination of cultural elements came together to create jazz? These two questions, which tribes formed the cultural backbone of musical innovation in the United States and where are you from? Create the conceptual structure for this project that I'm calling the DNA series. First, I'm gonna gather my family history then I analyze it. That allows me to put down a foundation and fill in that blank space. Then I'll use DNA testing to analyze scientifically the backgrounds of these stories, which will allow me to begin to fill in the gap of the middle passage and start to answer that question, where are you from? This will also allow me to identify some of the large cultural groups, some of the tribes that my African-American family is a part of. And it allows me to connect these groupings, these tribes, directly to the stream of thought and series of actions that produces American cultural innovation. The DNA series is gonna be a series of four records that will be based on my personal interaction with four cultural groupings. These four groupings, these tribes, will be found through determining my mother and father's root parental and root maternal, uh, root paternal and root maternal DNAs. I started working on this project at the Schoenberg Library of the Marl. Looking through the genealogy resources for clues relating to my family research, pouring through their research that they had collected on the connections between African Americans and Africa. That research tended to fall into two areas, African retentions in the New World and examinations of various African kingdoms, such as the Kingdom of Oyo, Kingdom of Dahomey, Congo Kingdom. And these kingdoms' relationship to Europe, the Americas, and their participation in the slave trade. From reading the majority of the research that you would see in a place like the Schomburg, you would come to the conclusion that African culture 
was lost in the United States. And the reason you would come to that conclusion would be because you don't see the kind of cultural tensions you see in a place like Chewbacca. So you don't see things like Santa Maria, you don't see samba, you don't see drums, you don't see any of these things. My conclusion actually was slightly different. While it's true that you don't see things like samba, or rumba, or orisha worship in the US, you also don't see the blues in Brazil. You don't see the banter down there. I became convinced it wasn't a question of African retention or loss. It was a question of a different set of people with a different aesthetic. So I started looking at what anthropologists call stateless societies, places that didn't follow the model of a king and subjects, but followed a different model that were a more democratic model and federations of communities without a centralized leader. It just seemed to me that the idea behind that sort of collective thinking is the same idea behind the collective improvisation you see in jazz. It's often said that jazz reflects the idea of American democracy. But it's not often noted that African Americans were rarely, if ever, full participants in the American political process at the time that jazz was created. After a trip to Salvador de Bahia in Brazil, a trip where I got to see Afro-Brazilians relate to each other in political, cultural, and family situations, I became convinced of two things. One, Brazilian cultures you see, the African cultures that you see in Brazil hadn't been lost in the US because the people who developed them would never have let that happen. You don't see those kind of hierarchical cultural structures here because the caretakers of that style of thinking didn't come to America in enough numbers to impose it. And two, I became convinced I needed to speak to my own family elders to pull the pieces of my family story together. So I went to the Manhattanville Projects in Harlem to speak to the oldest living relative on my dad's side of the family. If she were alive today, she'd be 100 years old. She was 89 when this interview was done in the year 2000. My name is um, Elizabeth Brown. First it was Elizabeth Gibbs, and then I married, my married name is Brown, Elizabeth Gibbs Brown. That's it. And my father's name was Solomon Gibbs. And his five was five of us, but all of them went back to glory. When you talk to a Lucy Nelda, the odds are strong you will hear amazing things. One of the main things that struck me, though, was a piece of info that she didn't know. started to give family. This person doesn't exist. They're just like this kind of cipher, just floating out there. I mean, the other amazing thing was something that she did know. You know how long I came here in 1930. So you know that's a heck of a long time. A whole lot of things done happened since I leave there. Mm -hmm. you know? happened here But you know, the most amazing thing to me of this conversation is that the whole thing about your grandma being a slave. I mean, what did she think about, I mean, if I can ask a somewhat rude question, my my grandmother. Yeah. What did, did I mean? What was her opinion of white people? Did she hate them? Did she? My grandmother. Yeah. No. 
You mean my father mother? Yeah. My father mother didn't need anybody because she was the midwife. Yeah. She brought a lot of those white people children into this world. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like a, like a, like the doctor now, but she was a midwife, you know. She nursed foot for the women when they're having the babies, you know. So she ain't, she ain't never hit nobody. Why well, you gonna hear them for? Okay? Things happen in your life that you can't do nothing about. So you just do the best you can. You see, they didn't have no control over slavery. You know what I mean? And ain't nobody holding them responsible for what happened in their life. If they do, there's a fool. Because if you don't have no control over your life, you're not responsible to for what happened. I found a book called When Endangered Roots Die. It was written by an anthropologist who lived on the island that my aunt, Aunt Liz, came from. She lived there for a year, checking out the people and their customs. Mm -hmm. Your father, was he like strong? Oh, yeah. Worked like a horse. Uh, Worked you like a horse, too. Mm, yes, sir. My father used to get up 5 o'clock in the morning. And when he get up and go field, and that's it, you better get up too, because my mother will call you tell you get out of that bed. In the book, she draws the conclusion that the culture on Wamala Island traces itself back to the Igbo people of Nigeria. Igbo culture is egalitarian. In the times when my great-grandfather, great-great-grandfather, great-great-grandfather would have been brought to America, there was no overriding political unit there. There were just these sort of interacting autonomous towns, villages, whatever. The people would set status by buying titles, by buying things, by earning things. If your dad had done something and your dad had ridden to a higher, high spot in the town, it didn't matter. You had to earn your own. In addition, the culture emphasized what in Igbo is called getting up. The more you had, the more you were worth. In society, the males farm and the females entrepreneurs are women make money. As I said, Igbo land was constructed of these small autonomous political units. And these political units would form alliances. And they also would war with each other. One would war against two, two would war against one, so forth and so on. And this constantly shifting mosaic of political intrigue, if you want to use that. In addition, there were things like corporate units that were based on either prestige secret societies, or just on how much money they made. And a strong corporate unit would go and negotiate with the town and they would make alliances. One of the strongest corporate units made its money by kidnapping people. Igbo religion stresses equality between God and self. And it stresses the fact that there is no man in between person and God. It stresses that each individual carries God inside of them. It also stresses the idea of the scapegoat, a person who dies for the sins of the community. In short, you can see precedents for both the good and the bad parts of African American culture and Negro culture. This is my story. This is the Gibbs family story. As more stories reveal themselves, 
story will enlarge or will expand. Some will read like mine, but it's safe to say a lot of them will. That should have been some won't read like mine, mine but it's safe to say a lot of them will. One of the main ways Igbos are remembered in America is through a story called the Igbo Landing Story. Uh, basically, the short version of it is a bunch of people were brought from what is now Nigeria to Charleston and they ended up in an island down the coast from where my parents were from, called St. Simon, which is closer to Savannah, Georgia. And they decided once, they, once the boat landed in St. Simons, they got off the boat and decided that they did not want to stay there. So 13 of them locked their arms, turned around, and walked back into the water. As I said earlier, for us, there's a blank space where the start of the culture is. Those Igbos who came from Nigeria obviously saw that same blank space and decided that they did not want to be formed by this country. By this country. But they also left behind a story, and they also left behind a way of thinking. And they left behind the idea that life is a journey. And to better yourself, sometimes you just got to keep moving. I wasn't going back down there to live. I could tell you me. And the thing is, South Carolina, I want. That's the same thing my father said. Mm -mm. After this, getting this book and showing this book to my father, the book of Endangered Woods Died, I decided it was time to kind of put the pieces together for real. And I asked my parents to take the annexes. My mom being more of a skeptic, I won't say she was reluctant, but I know my mom, and she's my mom, so I figured it was smarter to ask my dad first. So I asked my dad to take the test. And he did. And after a while, the results came back. This series of numbers is the closest thing I have to a name of my great, great, great grandfather. It signifies that he is a part of a large group of people that came from Africa. Very likely, of ego extraction. I mean, there's a point three there, but you know, what can you do? Very likely. And uh, that's good enough for me. In addition, after going down to South Dota Bahia, as I said earlier, and looking at some, how some of the family structures are, I felt pretty good that my family isn't structured the way those families are, and the people I know don't structure their lives that way. So I feel good that this is a correct interpretation. And also feel it adds to the story of how jazz starts. Because another thing about the Igbo people is that they take things from other cultures, even see, even with their own history, they have done archaeological research in sites of Igbo land and found stuff from India. They always add to the culture. They always incorporate from wherever they are. It's not a situation of a static thing. So, for me, this is the start. 
as I said, it's one of four. There would be many more stories, but DNA testing at this point only allows you to find a certain amount of stories. The stories of the Native American relatives can't be told again because they're not on the line. The stories of the European relatives can't is a whole another situation that tends not to get told. And the stories of the combinations, you start to see that this country is built by everybody interacting in a certain way. But the story of how they interacted needs to be developed. a little piece of music in honor of the idea that people who help form me who don't have a voice might one day get one.